Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm getting you kind of halfway through the conference now. Hopefully, you're all in the swing of it. Uh, my name is Jeremy Kerr. I work for the uh, IBM Auslabs Group, and one of the things we do is uh, getting getting Linux working on fancy new IBM hardware. Uh, part of that um, is kernel. Part of it is firmware. Part of there's all sorts of bits involved. One of them is um, is a bootloader. So, going to give a bit of background about bootloaders, what, what's involved, what we're doing, and what uh, what, what Petty Boot uh, what Petty Boot itself does. So, you have three kind of things that um, that we want out of a bootloader. Uh, we want to load our OS into memory somehow, so typically pulling it off disk or net or some weird device. We want to uh, transfer our execution into the OS that we've loaded and possibly give a bit of um, interaction to allow the users or administrators to, uh, to control how that boot process works. So maybe you want to select between different boot options or different operating systems or change the arguments you're going to give to that option to change the behavior of the system. So, Three kind of important things that, that we want our bootloader to do. Uh, typically, if you're familiar with um, with the Grub bootloader, kind of uh, the, I guess this is one of the standard cases of, of a, a bootloader for Linux. Um, in this case, we're talking to uh, some PC BIOS firmware. Now, PC BIOS is getting a bit uh, getting a bit old and being replaced by EFI now. So I'm going to kind of base my, my most of my examples on on what's sort of the current state of things with, with EFI. So in this case, we've got Grub um, talking to the the firmware. And the firmware in this case is, is sort of helping out the, the bootloader as an abstraction layer. So in this case, our, our bootloader has requested a read from the firmware. The firmware has a little, little disk driver which uh, performs the right commands to talk to the disk, to read a sector off the disk, data is returned to uh, this driver, and then the firmware returns that to, to the bootloader. So in this case, we're kind of using or including some of the functionality that firmware gives us in our, in our bootloader process. Um, and typically, that will be this. This read example will be to load our kernel into memory. So, in this case, uh, Grub has uh, used the firmware interface provided by this UEFI firmware. Uh, this interface here, we're using the, the read disk API, um, loading our loading our Linux kernel, and then finally passing the the the, uh, the execution to to the Linux kernel. So now the uh, the kernel is uh, is running. Uh, it's doing the usual boot stuff. So initializing our hardware, setting up all the kernel data structures, that sort of thing, drawing penguins on the screen. Uh, and, and one of the other things we'll do is we'll instantiate um, its own disk driver. So um, we'll have, uh, we'll have these, uh, this driver we use to then issue ATA to balance the disk uh, and, and do the kind of things you expect an OS to do in, in terms of reading and writing to the disk and, and whatnot. So here we, um, we kind of see a bit of a quirk. Um, we have two driver implementations. We have one in, in firmware and one in the kernel. Now, um, not necessarily a problem. I mean, it's only a, only a disk driver. It's, it's not a huge amount of code. Um, and I guess one of the quirks is that when, we, when we're doing bring up, we, we may have to write a driver twice. Um, so once for the, uh, once for the kernel, uh, for this, this one, and then once when we need our, our firmware to support that driver um, to boot from. But again, like I said, it's not a huge problem if we have a duplicated driver. Um, it, it, it's only a small part of code. The problem sort of comes when, when we start to get uh, other functionality in too. Say you want to boot from net. Uh, we'll, need a, uh, we'll have a network card on the device. Um, we also need a network driver to, to drive that. Uh, we're using a network driver. We probably need some way to, to sort of abstract the, the low-level network bits. So we'll have a TCP IP network stack. Um, UEFI uh, can support uh, booting over TFTP, so we need something that, that supports TCP for that. Uh, and then uh, perhaps, uh, well, actually, sorry, in this case, we've got um, a TCP driver in the firmware, but that, that API doesn't quite suit how Grub likes to boot. Um, so Grub actually ignores the, the network stack in the firmware and uses its own little, uh, little UDP-based uh, driver for TFTP loads off the network. We also probably want some user interaction from our, our firmware, so we might need a GPU driver as well, uh, just to display the, uh, the, our, our bootloader or, or firmware screens on, on an actual monitor. And we probably also want some input, so here we need a USB driver as well to, to handle your mashing on the keyboard and telling it to stop booting. Um, we might want sort of more advanced block devices, so, so we'll have a, a SCSI layer for that, um, to handle things like the LUNs and the targets and whatnot. <laughs> Um, we're getting, uh, well, since we've got a SCSI layer and a network layer, why don't we add some, some iSCSI as well? That's uh, 
supported by um, one of the, there's an EFI protocol for, for doing, doing iSCSI boot. Now we've got a few devices, maybe we'll want some sort of PCI layer to, to handle our, uh, <laughs> handle the, uh, the, the bridges and the targets and, and whatnot. Um, probably also want some way to automatically configure our network. So we'll have a DHCP, DHCP clients in there to, uh, to handle the auto, auto configuration. I'll probably also um, want to actually make use of the data we read off the disk. So we'll want a, a file system here. So we, kind of, we, could, we could go on all day adding stuff and thinking about all these weird boot configurations and whatnot. But um, this is kind of, I guess, a, a sensible amount of, of kind of things that we need to implement in the firmware to, to support the, the majority of, of, of use cases for, for, for our bootloader. Now, this is uh, somewhat suspiciously familiar. We have our firmware. If we just change a couple of words in that slide, we'll uh, come up with something we've hopefully all seen before. So the idea here is that, you're here is that we're using Linux as our bootloader, or using Linux as, as a component of our bootloader. Um, we have a lot of existing code, a lot of code that uh, is, you know, is hopefully quite, uh, quite high quality. And, and the idea here is we can use, um, use the stuff that's already been done to implement the, the bootloading phase of our, our machine uh, bring up and, and deployment. So if we use Linux our bootloader, we get um, good hardware support. Um, I guess the, the assumption here is that if your um, device, um, if, if you're using your device in the, the kind of regular operation of the system, Linux will have support for that device. So therefore, anything you might want to boot off, Linux will support that device. So we, we might as well use the uh, drives in Linux to do that. We also get a good amount of memory management. Um, Generally, firmware is, is all running in the, the single address space, um, usually real mode. When we're using um, Linux as our, our bootloader, we can have that separation that, that, uh, that we get with, with uh, separate processes, separate address spaces, and, and whatnot. Um, Linux itself is well tested. We have the, the hardware support is, is, um, has been through uh, quite a lot of testing. Um, sometimes not as much as we like, but it is, it is fairly well tested, and we'll probably find that the testing that Linux gets on its, its device drivers and, and the block layers and that sort of thing is, is used, uh, you know, it's spending a lot more time running on your machine than any firmware will ever be, or any, any firmware boot services will be, so it will receive more attention to testing and, and it'll be higher quality code. And very importantly, the code for the, the boot, or the, the drivers and everything is available. We can, we can hack on them, we can fix bugs, we can implement our crazy things, and we can, we can play with the, the bits we need to to play with to implement the kind of boot process that we want to implement. So we've got the, um, the, the loading part sorted out. We know that um, we can load files in Linux. If not, we're in a bit of trouble. But we can load files. We can do that sort of thing. That was one of our features of a required features of bootloader. We cover some of the, um, one of the other, other features we need is, is the execution of that, that kernel. Now, we use a, a facility called kexec. Um, you might already be familiar with it, but just a, a quick overview. Um, so we have a, a kernel that's running on our machine. In this case, this will be our, our, the kernel we're using for our bootloader. Um, we have a, a system call uh, called kexec load. And now this, you pass it a, a list of uh, pointers to, to bits of memory that are your kernel. And it will load that, uh, that kernel B, the second one, into a, uh, a, a reasonable chunk of memory. Um, and then we can then execute that second kernel using this, uh, using this standard reboot system call with a, a magic, uh, magic value for the, uh, the argument. So in that case, the, the execution uh, is, is handed over to kernel B. Um, kernel A is still in memory, but not actually doing anything. Uh, kernel B is then free to free up any of the memory or resources used by that initial kernel. And now we have just your, your second kernel running on the machine, hopefully in a fairly clean environment, just like you'd booted it directly. So that's the kexec facility, um, and that, that's how the, the, we hand over execution in, in a Linux-based bootloader. So now sort of enough abstract talk. Um, let's go into some of the details of Pettyboot. So we had those three things, the loading, the, the execution, and the, the user interaction. This is how we do it in Pettyboot. So Pettyboot is a, a, a runs all completely in user space. Um, I guess Pettyboot is the, the component that does the bootloady bits. We also have uh, a Pettyboot-based firmware would be Pettyboot plus the kernel and, and the other, uh, other sort of things that we need to, to have a complete running system. Anyway, so we have Pettyboot. We have, um, it listens to hot plug events. So as your machine is booting, devices will be uh, discovered by the, the hot plug infrastructure. 
and uh, Pettyboot receives uh, notifications those devices are available. We then look on those devices for any, um, any configurations that might indicate there's an OS installed. So basically we'll look for existing bootloader configurations to say, here's your kernel, here's your RAM disk, and here's your kernel arguments. And that, we then extract a, a boot option from, from that configuration. Uh, depending on, on our environment, we'll, probably, we'll typically execute that, um, that kernel, um, the one that we've loaded, or sorry, we'll fi find a kernel from that boot option that we're supposed to load, load it, and then, uh, then k-exec into, into that kernel. And of course, we have some method of user interaction to, to cover that. So uh, that, that's kind of our three, three features of bootloader that we've, uh, that's the way we implement in Pettyboot. So the structure of Pettyboot, everyone likes diagrams, um, is uh, kind of a, a really lightweight client server kind of thing. We, we just talk over a, um, a, uh, a single socket. Uh, we have, so we have this discover server, which um, is responsible for receiving um, the notifications of new devices and kind of collating all that and acting as basically a, a, a database of, of, of the boot options that are available on the machine. Very lightweight. I mean, just sort of link list, nothing, nothing serious database style here. Um, and we spawn a, a UI client on anything that might be, a, a user might be interacting with. So, for example, a serial port, a, uh, a, a GPU, or whatever, whatever um, method a user might be interacting with that machine, we spawn a separate process to, to handle client interactions over that, to, over that device. So the basic flow, uh, we have UDEV hot plug events coming into our, our Discover server. We use libudev, but it, it's very lightweight. Um, <coughs> So when we see a, a suitable device that might contain some kind of boot option, um, we run it through, we, we notify the parsers. So we have a set of parsers in the, um, in the uh, server code. And so we have one for Grub, we have one for Pixie, we have one for Yarboot, and I think we have a Kboot one, but that's, that's not often used. So we have these parsers. The parsers are notified there's a new block device. Go and, go and find if there's a Grub config on it and then extract the, the boot options from that, that grub config. Um, it, anything that it does find, it then passes on to the, the UI client saying, here are the available boot options. And as they come in, those, those UIs will hopefully update uh, a list on the screen so you can see what's, what's now available to boot from. Um, so let, let's say a user comes along and, and is sitting on a serial port, uh, is interacting with Petty Boot, uh, and then sees a boot option and says, I want to boot that one. Just a small message is sent from the UI back to the server to say, Boot this option here, and that's kind of it. Then we, then we, the Discover server runs kexec, and we're, and we're happily running our, our new kernel. So rather than just pictures, um, we'll do a bit of a demo. You can see that. So what I'm going to do here is um, start a virtual machine. Uh, that, that uses the Petty Boot bootloader. Um, the virtual machine is, a, is just QMU uh, emulating a PowerPC system. Nothing about Petty Boot is, is architecture specific because it's, it's just a user space process. But we tend, or because we work on PowerPC, that's what I'm demoing here. In this case, where we've got a Debian installer ISO uh, that will be attached to that, that virtual machine. So my script here just runs QMU with all the right arguments and then sets things up correctly. So you start it. And here we're just getting the output from the virtual serial port onto our, onto our terminal here. So we've got uh, our firmware booting. We've now got our kernel D message coming out. Remember, this is our, um, our lightweight kernel built into a, the Pettyboot system. And then we're in hit user space, and now we're, uh, now we're running Pettyboot. So it's just discovered a, a bunch of options on the, the um, uh, the Debian ISO. I'm just going to interrupt this boot process. As you can see, we had that countdown down the bottom saying that if we didn't select an option, uh, it was going to boot the Debian default install. So um, this is our UI. We've got some information about the system up here and the, uh, the boot options that, uh, that we've found on, on that block device. Um, I'm just going to... This is uh, looking at uh, the, um, as you can see, we've got, still got a little bit of tweaks to do on the, uh, on the UI with, with ISOs. But um, this is showing the detail of that, that first boot option. Uh, we're using this VDA device. We found an image and an ID on that. And uh, that's, what would we, well, that's what we'd be booting if we were to select that option. If we go back, um, we also have a little system information panel. 
uh, just shows some information about the system. The main purpose of this is so we can find out uh, some identity of the system, find out which MAC addresses it has and, and whatnot. We also have a, a tiny little configuration interface. Um, this is uh, mainly to allow an easy way to configure the network and that sort of thing of the machine. Um, that does nothing special. All of this is, is um, the same as any of the IF config or whatnot tools, but saves that state into, into persistent storage in the machine. So the next time you boot, you will have the same network settings and whatnot. Uh, at the moment, this is the, all, all the defaults. Uh, we're defaulting to DHCP in every interface we find uh, and, and time out after 10 seconds if we don't find, if, if there's no user interaction. So we'll just cancel this. Um, as I said before, we're using a standard Linux system here. So of course we have a standard Linux shell ready to go. So remember, we're still in the bootloader at this stage. We haven't, we haven't actually booted our final OS. We're running a tiny Linux system and, and we have a shell available. So we can do our standard kind of things. Actually, I'll give you some details about how we boot. This is our discover server here, which I, I mentioned. This is listening to all the hot plug events, discovering any, any um, boot options that are available. And now we have a UI running here. Now I've exited the UI. This, this UI process is actually one listening on a separate serial port. So this virtual machine has a different has two serial ports. Um, one of the UIs is still running, the other one's exited because we're now in the shell on the serial port. But that, that same client server model where we have a, uh, an extra process for our, um, or one, one process per serial port. Also see our, year, year, our DHCP client running here. Um, just running a standard small DHCP client. And that, that's what we're using to configure the, uh, the network in Pettyloop. We pass a few extra options to get to allow um, discovery of boot options, but that, that's kind of a little, a little too complex for now. Um, we have all the, the standard bits here. Um, interestingly, we should be able to. So we have wget. We have all our, our cool tools. So we can actually, you know, in our bootloader here. Remember, we're still in the bootloader. Um, we can we can do all sorts of, of things you would expect from the next system. Um, if I actually notice here, we've we've mounted our um, our Debian ISO uh, into the file system. We have a, a small tree of um, of uh, device devices that we mount. Anything we discover, we'll, we'll mount under this uh, var petty boot mount um, directory. And this is a um, just the the device we found from um, that we've discovered through Hotplug. So. Uh, the hot plug system will trigger mounts of everything, read-only mounts, uh, so that we don't, we don't alter anything inadvertently. Um, and then Pettyboot would have read the uh, the Yahoo config from this uh, this ISO, and then present each each one of these would have generated a um, a boot option that we saw back in our UI here. So let's uh, do what we expect to do with a bootloader and actually boot something. So we've, we've shut the, the petty boot kernel down. We did that reboot system call, and now we're running the Debian kernel. So this is just producing the dmessage output, as you'd expect. Um, and this kernel was, again, discovered from the, the Debian ISO. And we're doing the standard Debian bits. We are running virtually here, fully in my laptop. But, and then we have the Debian install. So that's, um, that's petty boot. Um, I always wondered why there's a C language option here. I don't know anyone who speaks C natively. Yeah. It's true. Uh, have you found that back recording already? No, no. Cool. So that's that's pretty good. Um, uh, so what I, what I've what we've sort of covered here so far is kind of the basic bootloader function. You think things that you expect from a bootloader, things that aren't that exciting. We've just managed to, to boot a kernel. Um, what I did promise in the title of this this talk was was interesting things. Um, so. We find that the, the standard Linux environment that we get from Pettyboot um, gives, us, gives us some cool opportunities. Um, as you saw, I did that wget. Uh, not many bootloaders let you wget directly from your bootloader environment. So some of the things that have come out of that, um, I guess the disclaimer here is these are ideas. They may not be good ideas. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> one, one actual thing that we found is uh, having, having a, a Linux system um, in your bootloader is actually really helpful for debug. Um, we, when, we're, when we're doing bring up, we don't need to worry about having, having an operating system to boot to. We can just kind of have our operating system right here. And if, if there's any problems with a production system, you know, if, if it hasn't booted, um, if it hasn't found a, a 
a, a grub config or whatnot. Um, we're kind of we're a little bit stuck in terms of we don't have the tools we usually need to fix the problem. But in this case, we have a, a small we have VI in there. We have a small um, Linux user space where we can use use VI, for example, to to edit our bootloader config or fix up any configuration files that aren't right or or maybe fix the FS tab in in the operating system we want to boot. So we have we have that facility to either fix bootloader configuration or fix operating system configuration that may be preventing us from booting. So that that's um, that's one kind of advantage that we didn't really predict when we were writing this thing, but um, it's, been, it's been kind of handy. One of the areas that, uh, that we sort of work in a bit is, um, is the cluster environment. Um, and quite a few folks that I, I've spoken to have, have issues with using, uh, typically your netboot, because you don't want to keep 10,000 kernels on one on each of your machines or 10,000 machines. So you want a netboot. And, and one issue that's been coming up a bit is, is using TFTP to network. You have a very simple network stack, so you want to use a very simple protocol, TFTP, to, to transfer your boot files from your machine. Um, but when, you, when you're booting 10,000 machines at once, you'll see lost packets, you'll see uh, retransmits, you'll see lots of things that, that kind of make UDP not quite the best option for the job here. So if we could use something TCP-based, it would be good. EFI um, does have support, or some, some firmwares do have support for FTP, but why not do something like HTTP boot? We, we had that wget before. You can specify HTTP URLs in your bootloader config. Pettybit will read those and allow you to boot straight from, from an HTTP server. Security considerations aside, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great. Um, we don't see a lot of support for HTTP in bootloaders, um, probably because it's not a great idea to do real mode string parsing in C in your bootloader. So here, because we're using standard Linux tools, we're using wget, um, we're using things that have been tested quite a bit. And we use, you know, we use things that have been out in the environment. We're kind of a bit more confident about using, um, using our user space HTTP uh, client um, without, without too much concern about running that in the bootloader. So that, that, that's been kind of cool. So heading further into the maybe not so great an idea territory, but still crazy, uh, why don't we have a web app that serves our kernels to us? Um, rather than having to worry about reconfiguring Pixie or getting a netboot uh, systems all um, running, well, why don't we just have one HTTP app, or sorry, one, one web app that, that serves kernels to whatever machines uh, are requesting them. So we can do a bit of dynamic things there. And typically, I guess you'd implement this by having a, um, a database and some sort of uh, web app that queries your database and finds out what kernel is supposed to boot, serves that kernel back to the... Uh, um, to your machine and then, and then boots that. Why not go one step further and, and take out the, the web app and make your uh, servers configure themselves? That you could have your, your database client libraries directly on your bootloader and, and uh, doing queries to rescue. I mean, like I said, not necessarily a good idea, but uh, we, we can still do this. This is, this is sort of the flexibility we get by using a standard Linux system to, uh, to boot uh, nodes in your cluster. Um, one other thing I mentioned in the, the abstract was uh, BitTorrent. There were some, some folks that were trying to sort of shoehorn uh, BitTorrent into their cluster boot environment. You've got uh, 10,000 whatever machines booting at once. Why don't you save some network bandwidth by, or say, increase some reliability by, by having, uh, having BitTorrent uh, used to, to serve your kernels around the cluster? Now, perhaps that's a little too heavyweight. Um, we might have you know, concerns about running BitTorrent or anything in our bootloader. Maybe we could experiment with our own kind of um, multicast protocol. Maybe there's, there's some, some work we want to do in experimentation with different multicast protocols, booting 10,000 machines at once. Why don't you share that traffic around? So again, we're using a standard Linux environment to, um, to do our booting. Uh, pretty easy to develop for. I, I'm sure most of you guys have done some, um, some work on, on you know, user space programs. Um, you know how to program for, for PD boot, so that's great. And it's pretty simple to add, add a little bits in. A bit of, bit of history on Pettyboot now. Um, it was originally written uh, when a few of us in the team were working on the um, our Linux on PS3 bits. Um, so we have we have a PS3. It, it supports Linux. Um, there's a, about a four megabytes four megabytes bin of flash that we had. Um, so we have four megabytes of flash to put our bootloader in. Minus, minus yeah, X. Increasingly growing X all the time, wasn't it? it was, uh, but anyway, so we had a little. Um, little area to put our bootloader in. And rather than writing a bootloader scr for, from scratch for PS3, we, we wrote, uh, wrote Pettyboot. Uh, again, similar style, uh, uh, very similar to how it is today. The UI is our server, um, 
the same structure. And using that, because we had a, you know, you, generally if you're, you're booting your PS3, you, you have a TV there, you have a, maybe a keyboard, maybe something over Bluetooth. We have the um, uh, basically spe specific requirements we want out of a UI. You want to be able to see it from your couch and that sort of thing. So rather than using a text, uh, text console, we had this nice little frame buffer display for our bootloader. Again, everything is still running in the bootloader. We're not, we haven't hit our final OS yet. This is just the way you would select your, um, uh, your, the machine you wanted to boot from that stage. Um, I'm not sure why we came up with the idea of Igloo OS, but uh, I think I had an icon and we needed something to go with that. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is one of our test, test boots for, um, for Linux and PS3. Now, implementing something, this, something like this from scratch in a, in a real mode bootloader would be a, a giant pain. So we used some of the existing um, uh, graphics drawing libraries that Keith Packard wrote uh, called Twin. Uh, that combined with some, just some munging of input layer stuff and we had ourselves a, a nice, uh, nice frame buffer bootloader using existing bits of code and, and not a whole lot of, whole lot of plumbing. So that, that, would, that was really good. Uh, one of the advantages, again, of using a vanilla user space for our, for our bootloader. Um, we also have options for, for remote access. Um, there's nothing stopping us from putting an SSH server, uh, maybe apart from Sanity, uh, on, our, on our, um, our bootloader. So um, it's entirely possible to put an SSH server. You probably use it for more um, debug and, and more than just automated management tasks, but it's definitely possible. Um, we also have um, potential, potential uh, features of, of security and authentication. Um, we have some standard bits available to us, things like GPG and OpenSSL, which we can use to authenticate um, the kernel and the bootloader, or the, the kernel and the RAM disk, and the bits that we're, we're jumping into from, from Pettyboot. One of the challenges here, though, is, is why it isn't implemented already, is, um, is defining where the root of that trust for any sort of authentication is. Um, EFI has quite a, a few definitions about how that's done. Um, I, I'm not... I'm not sure if we want to follow the same way or, or do something um, very similar to that, but we, did, we have all the tools here to implement um, proper authenticated boot um, as long as we can sort of share some sort of uh, uh, predefined uh, root of trust. Now, I've covered, I, I guess, a, a few, few potentially crazy things. Um, hopefully there, there's some other ideas out there in the crowd. And to that end, I think I'd like to call it, cover a bit of development of petty boot. And, and just a, a brief section on, on how, how things work at the moment and how you can, uh, you can start playing with it. So Petaboot uses all the good stuff, user space, C, Git. Um, it, it's po entirely possible to add uh, other things into the Petaboot environment, um, but the actual the discover server and the processes and the UIs are, are all, all C at the moment. Um, but again, because we're in user space, we could do Python, we could do Perl, we could, we could do whatever. Yes, Ben. I have my tree up. I haven't announced it very widely, so it is possible to, to build it. Um, so Ben, so the question was, do we do we have a builder script up? Um, I wasn't going to mention builder until this slide, but uh, <laughs> um, so as I said, we're in user space. We're in C. We get when, when you compile Pettyboot, you get a user space binary. Now you can't boot that, of course, because it's a user space binary. Um, so we need to combine the the Pettyboot user space with a libc, with a, um, you know, the libraries we need for Pettyboot, with UDEV, with a DHCP um, client, that sort of thing, into something that can be booted by the hardware. So we use Builderit to do that, uh, which uh, takes various components and an excellent project for building embedded user space uh, bits. I think there's a talk at the LCA, but it's probably already been um, yesterday. Yep. But so we use Builderit to, um, to construct out of Pettyboot Couple of other projects, uh, a init, init RAMFS, um, and it's I'm amazed how small you can get these things with Builder. We've got I think our, our bootloader in 2.1 megabytes at the moment, and that's with no kind of work on trimming things down. So, out of the box, 2.1 megabytes for our entire Linux system is great. We added a kernel to that, and then that that becomes your bootable um, OS, which which is your bootloader. So I'll give a, a bit of a um, a quick uh, quick tour of. How we build, how we do a petty bit build. Um, I'll just blow away my. Move to the side. Sorry? Move. No, that's all right. It's not important. <laughs> 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 
I say that now. <laughs> so here I've just built, I've just dropped the, um, the build tree for, for Petty Boots. And now we're running the standard um, builder make scripts, uh, which it, it's only building the Petty Boot component. It's only, sorry, it's only rebuilding the Petty Boot component. Uh, standard configure make make install builder. It knows how to um, how to construct various uh, uh, open source uh, code bases, uh, build them, you know, possibly download the sources, build them, configure them, and then put them into a um, into our, our live file system. So now out of this we have a um, we've just built. Couple of uh, oh, it's uh, grown a bit today. Uh, so this is our our rootfs here. So um, because I had most of the the other projects already built in my tree, um, it didn't it didn't rebuild everything. But here we just rebuilt the the Pettyboot project, constructed our um, our rootfs. And then that's what we use for our, our in around MFS when we plug it into our kernel. Is this the of uh, I can give you the expanded. Um, so that's contrary to what it says. It is actually it's our, this is our root file system um, in its expanded form. Um, there is a warning there that it's not. Uh, so you don't go and use that directly, but the CPIO is the sort of the official format, and this is the expanded version of that. So, sorry. sorry. Would you get any real win from using um, BZ or LSR? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, oh, sorry. The the question was, would we get uh, any advantage of using different uh, compression algorithms? So LMA, BZ, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. I, I, we're just using um, GZIP in this case because it's it's easy, it's fast. Um, it's not a huge issue nowadays because when you build a kernel with uh, MitronFS, the kernel reads by itself. You can specify the compressor to support any of the support yeah. the data, any of the data. So you can use actually the CPI you yeah. want compressed here. And on the kernel grid side, just say you want it compressed. Yeah. So, so what Ben was saying there is um, we may as well just use the uncompressed one because when we build that into the kernel, it gets compressed anyway. So, and we can select which encryption algorithm, we, or sorry, which compression algorithm we want to use for that. Uh, this is again a kernel configuration option rather than a builder one. Um, now, unfortunately, because there's kind of we're not just doing a single build and test of, of P boot, there's a bit of complexity in the um, in the, in the testing cycle. So you, you write some code, you might update a parser to support some new grub feature, uh, and you want to test that. You don't want to have to to go through the entire um, user space build uh, build process, um, and then build a, a sorry user space build process, then build your uh, kernel and MRFS and then test that and do something. So we do have a, um, a an in, in tree test suite, uh, as as most projects should, um, where we uh, can test the critical components of Pettyboot. Sort of the, the bits that we can separate, which don't require everything to be integrated. So we at the moment we use this to test um, things like our, um, our we've got a, a list library. We, we use that. We run those tests in. In our in tree, uh, we test all of our parsers. Um, have most parsers have a, a, um, quite a few test cases <clears throat> to ensure that uh, we kind of do the right thing when we see various grub configurations or yar boot configurations or whatnot. And that that's incredibly easy to run. We just run make check, and it, it runs through all the the tests. And one really nice thing about running our, our tests in tree is that we can um, or running our tests in tree for a user space project is we can run them under Valgrind. So we can do our our Bootloader um, validation in user space with proper memory checking and, and proper uh, point of validation and, and use of the free and all that sort of stuff that the Valgrin gives us, we can use to to validate um, our user space bootloader. But that, that's always, that's not always enough. Um, we do want to test some things like you know when you see a uh, a DHCP response from a certain server with these options, we want to make sure that it does the right thing in terms of requesting the. the the kernel resources and whatnot. So we do have some um, some integration tests, um, and they're implemented as a uh, it's an out of tree just a, a little Python thing that I've got going um, that spawns a QMU virtual machine with a 
tiny little fake network and a tiny and a configurable block device configuration. So we can plug basically each test says put this you know put this block device on with this particular grub configuration file in this file name, and then run petty boots. Expect to see that boot option appear in the list of boot options. When you boot it, make sure that it's tried to request the right kernel from that block device. So we can do all these sorts of things by using using QMU um, and uh, using Kumi to, to sort of handle the, the virtual boot. Of course, it doesn't test our real hardware behavior. Um, that kind of becomes a, I guess, a, a more, more difficult problem. But it's not something that Petty Boot really needs to, to worry about because it is a standard user space pro program. We shouldn't need to worry too much about intricacies of hardware. That's all handled by the kernel. We can kind of hand wave that away. Hopefully, the kernel works better. So that, that's kind of the, the overview of how I, what, what the development of Petty Boot looks like. Um, it's, it's all done in one Git tree. Uh, on git.kernel.org. I won't put the full URL because it'll take up the, uh, the entire slide, but um, git.kernel.org. Um, the, the project itself is made by, maintained by um, a, colleague, uh, a colleague in open source, uh, Jeff Levant. Uh, he and I do most of the commits, but there's a few other contributors as well, including Ben, Ben who's here. Um, so that's, that's kind of how to do it. Any questions? Cool. Uh, let's start at the front. Uh, it, yes, yes. It, it's something I'm, I'm working on once we've kind of done our initial release. Um, sorry, IPv6 handling. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely, it shouldn't be too much trouble. Um, it just means that we need to make sure that we handle the addresses correctly in our parser. Uh, but other than that, um, shouldn't be a whole lot of work. There may be, maybe there'll be some difficulties around DHCP for IPv6 and, and Slack and, and whatnot, but I don't imagine it to be much, again, because we're just using user space bits. So, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, how easy is it to build a pretty good image with different drivers in it for some of the hardware? Oh, simple. It's just a matter of configuring a kernel to have those drivers. So, um, separate packages are going to be able to switch to using one line control mission. Okay. So the question was how how you would build with um, how easy it is to include different drivers um, in in the Petty Boot system, and and yeah, I think. Because when Pettyboot itself doesn't care about the kernel it's running on, as long as the kernel can run standard use based processes, Pettyboot itself doesn't mind. Um, doing, doing the infrastructure to allow, allow that um, is more a product of your build process rather than your development process, that's all. So as long as you can build a kernel with that, you're fine. Yes? How does it compare to Core Boot? How does it compare to Core Boot? Um, I haven't played a lot with Core Boot, so not quite sure. Um, can you give me a, a two sentence background? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> nope. <clears throat> Sorry, at the back here. Um, so you said that you didn't know how you might not be able to do it. So the question was say you want to upgrade the, the kernel that Pettyboot is using or the Pettyboot system, is that easy to do? Now that um, kind of brings about a, an interesting problem is that if we can boot the Pettyboot kernel, why don't we just boot straight into your operating system? Now, um, I guess the, the answer to that is, is more about management. Uh, you want to be able to have um, some way to, to select which boot options are available and that sort of thing. So, but of course, if there, if there are serious bugs in your kernel, you want to upgrade the petty boot thing as well. Now, I imagine uh, a sort of implement, a system that implements the petty boot bootloader, that, that includes the petty boot bootloader, will have a very light firmware that includes maybe one driver to pull the petty boot kernel off, something like uh, Flash. So um, how easy that is depends on the system that it's on. Um, for, for experimentation about this, I, I would assume that um, one, one way you could sort of start using Petty Boot on your own system is to build it as, a, as an EFI stub and then have your EFI um, firmware boot straight into to Petty Boot and then you get the full, full Petty Boot system from that. Uh, but again, it will depend on the system and how, how it works. Yes? Can I run this on my? Um, so you, you can boot it as just as a, a standard Linux system. Sorry, I repeat the question. Can you can you boot this on your um, E40 bucks main like uh, white box system with with not much NVRAM? Um, you don't have to put an NVRAM. You could put it on disk. You're kind of defeating the purpose of petty boot at that stage because you're booting a kernel. And but it's possible to put it somewhere and and uh, and uh, and boot it from you know. Put it on your disk or whatever. Um, it's probably not going to be the optimal situation for that for the um, for your existing BIOS-based machine because you can just uh, 
you can boot your operating system, whatever. But if you want the flexibility in the feature set that Pettyboot gives you, you can just boot it like your normal operating system. And then you have sort of a three-stage process rather than a two one, but that's fine. The actual resources in the system won't matter at all. It's a tiny kernel. It's, it's not um, performance sensitive um, at the moment, unless you have large amounts of disks, which we're, which we're looking at at the moment. Uh, Matthew. Uh, so how reliable have you found KXX to start to come out of the library? So the question was, how reliable have I found KXX? Um, do you want the Anton answer? Or are we, <laughs> um, so what we're actually using for the testing I've been doing is a very, very stripped down version of the KXX user space. Are you talking about the user space or the? The kernel. Um, so what we can do with Pettyboot is boot Pettyboot. Uh, so one of the tests I've done is uh, set up a boot option on our on a device that just sort of re-execs the same kernel and, and init run FS. Now, uh, at the moment, I think we get around 1,000 boots until it stops working. But it stops working because of the ATI driver, not KXX. So we have other fruits there that, uh, that is, is lower hanging than, than KXX, which is really nice. Um, uh, I've I think, uh, I think and, and we can you know, sort of work on those driver issues and, and hopefully get that fixed. But I haven't actually seen any reliability problems at all with the testing we've been doing with KXX, which is nice. Is this testing with VMs or on actual hardware? Both. Yep. Which different sorry, question was, have we testing on VMs and actual hardware? Yes, yeah, both. <coughs> and sorry, the, the follow-up? And, and with different kernels, or does KXX need the same kernel? Uh, so the question is, with different kernels or KXEC into the same kernel? Um, the KXEC I've been doing has been loading a new kernel over the network and then booting that. So it's a separate file, but it's the same binary. Right. And, yeah. So we're not, not doing the, the trick of, of booting back into the same thing. But, yeah. Yeah, uh, Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the ATI problem I saw was, I don't think that was KXEC related. I think it was, I, I can't say really, but um, yeah, it, it, is a, it was also a good test of, of drivers and their shutdown methods and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I guess to expand on that, the, the issue with drivers is that if, if you're KXEC in your machine and you have some PCI device, for example, doing a DMA into somewhere in memory, you, your new kernel might be using that for something completely different. So. Uh, there are some classes of problems where a device is still running uh, and, and has, has written over something that we need to use in our new kernel. Yes? I have two questions. You might be able to answer them with one answer. Um, VMcrypt for your kernel, can you, is that included already? And the other question is, before I enter in my laptop, what's going to happen after the app gets installed, pity boot, or rather, what do I have to do to make it work? So because you've got your finger over the enter key, I'll answer the second one first. So the question was, what happens if... Um, if I run out to get installed Pettyboot on my laptop, nothing. Um, so that will install the user space bit of Pettyboot. It won't replace your bootloader or anything like that. You'll have a, a binary that implements the Pettyboot discover server and the UIs. It, it won't do any, any sort of uh, thing, I don't, like any, any change to system configuration. And you'll probably get some really old code too. So, but, well, then, uh, but then it's steady and unstable, like loop code. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it, the, the, pack, the packaging hasn't been updated for quite a while. So. Yeah, but then, then I would install, use the user space to install it onto a disk or onto NVRAM. Yeah, exactly right. Well, no, that, that still wouldn't be a bootable image. That would be the user space bits of Pettyboot, which would then need to wrap up into a bootable image. So the, the Debian infrastructure, uh, and not many of the packaging infrastructures will support building an entire system into a single package. So you need, you'd really need to use something like Builder it to to get the Pettyboot sources and build it up into, into a full running system. So that, I'm, I haven't looked at the Debian package myself, but I assume that they haven't provided the, the init run FS and all the bits you need to get, to get Pettyboot running. Uh, and the first part of the question? Um, the, uh, DMcrypt? Yeah, do we support DMcrypt? Um, so I have a, a cut down version of the, um, uh, the MD Atom 
bits. Uh, I don't think I've put dmcrypt in my builds. There's nothing stopping you from using buildroot and including dmcrypt bits. You'd also have to put, I'm, I'm assuming you need some sort of key on there in advance and, and whatnot, or at least have to type in, yeah. yeah. So but definitely possible. We have the all the bits required, like it's a normal uh, user, uh, Linux system. There's no reason you couldn't build a pedi-boot image with, with whatever you need to boot installed. One at the back, Kevin. Yeah, Last question. Uh, so the question was, is it possible to boot kernels that don't support KEXEC? Yes. Uh, the, the fact that your second kernel doesn't support KEXEC has no bearing on, on how it goes. As long as we can... Um, well, yeah, it, it's up to the first kernel whether or not we can KEXEC. Uh, as, long as, as long as the KEXEC tools can, can parse it and do that sort of thing. Um, for my tests, I wrote basically a tiny shim that prints out. Um, it, it's basically a tiny kernel that prints out, yes, we, we KEXEC. And that doesn't support KEXEC, and it boots fine. So. Cool. Um, if there's any other questions or anything, um, uh, let me know after the talk. I'll be around for the rest of the week. i be happy to chat about it. And thank you all. Thank you.